why I didn't in the past take the time to point out what I want to point out now, which is the important underlying uh, conceptual foundation that justifies some, um, some of the mathematical operations that you will see done when we um, encounter some of the more challenging questions you see both in electricity and magnetism. So, so uh, let me kind of point you to the place in the textbook where it does mention it so that it's not just me bringing this out of nowhere. <laughs> let me give you some bit of a pointer on where in the textbook you can see this. So that, this is my standard practice. Almost every question has a link to the textbook section. And when you follow this link, as I hope you do in many different questions, you will see in this section um, some discussion of how to handle when you have more than a pair of charges interacting. So if you have a charge and you are looking for force on that charge due to multiple other charges, then when you get to that part, it will have this bold-faced um, text. Ah, here it is principle of superposition. You should remember me talking about principle of superposition last semester in Physics 4A, when we do waves and uh, more of about waves, but also oscillators, but more about waves. That when we talked about waves and wave interference, we talked about principle of a superposition. And the thing I say normally is we give it such a grandiose name because it's a uh, such a simple thing. The operation you do is just a simple addition. Um, and we give it a grandiose name. Not only because it's, uh, not only because it's uh, simple, but also because it's conceptually important. And this is how it's uh, conceptually important. There is a uh, mathematics that justifies principle of the superposition. And frankly, what you see us doing here is something that um, you might be surprised that we are putting in, I am putting in such emphasis because, I mean, isn't that what we've always done? <laughs> I didn't <laughs> know that it was something that deserves a special name. <laughs> so why am I taking time to point this out? Is in this semester, I will be able to point out some um, cases where if you are just uh, trying to blindly apply the principle of superposition, that it doesn't apply. There are times when superposition applies and there are times when it doesn't. And when, we, when you take linear algebra, um, you will see a more, um, uh, you will see a better mathem mathematical grounding for what justifies principle of superposition. And it in a single word, it comes down to linearity. There's a property of functions called the linearity. And whenever the thing it is you're dealing with is a linear function or a linear mathematical object or some kind of mathematical object <laughs> for which linearity property holds, then superposition, of, uh, superposition principle applies. And later on in the semester, uh, actually not that much later, in about two, three weeks, you're going to see some quantities which are not linear. Therefore, for them, superposition principle doesn't apply. It just turns out that uh, force vectors happens to be one of the things that, uh, for, that uh, have this linear property that net force is simple sum of, um, of all the constituent forces. So that's why principle of superposition, this is something we were kind of assuming without any mathematical justification that was valid in physics 4A. And what we are now doing is we are actually spelling out what justifies it because you are going to see a broader, um, broader groupings of mathematical objects use and the physical quantities. You are used to forces and you will see electric fields introduced and fields and forces are very tightly related. That's why when principle of superposition holds for forces, we can also say it holds for electric fields. 
but okay, in about two to three weeks, you will see that not all quantities that are related to field and forces um, will obey this uh, principle of superposition. So, so with all that lengthy introduction, um, superposition principle is what um, what is used to justify the process uh, used here. So uh, with that long conceptual introduction to the procedure that we'll be using, let me go through the procedure and actually answer this question. It says, what is the force on charge Q at the lower right corner? Let me just mark that so that I don't forget. Lower right corner of the square shown here. Okay. Hmm. It looks like it's asking for magnitude and direction. I'm not going to do anything super fancy. I'm still going to use the regular axis of straight x and y axis. But what I am going to do is I'm going to look at force due to each one of these three charges. And I'm going to use the vector notation to simply uh, write down one vector equation, work through that one vector equation to get the information I need to calculate what they're asking for, magnitude and direction. So these three charges will be applying a force. So let me just label them for um, clarity's sake. Here's charge one. That's going, to, they are both the same sign. So it's gonna apply a repulsive force away from that charge. And here's charge two. It's also um, same sign as, they're all the same sign. So it's gonna apply another repulsive force away from the, the source of the electric force. And finally, for charge three, it's going to apply another uh, force to uh, apply this repulsive force. So, um, you know, I didn't explicitly label this before I started, but what I am drawing here is a free body diagram because it's, the question is asking a force question and I want to make sure I include all the information in a correct way. And I did take care as I was drawing these force labels um, that I drew this particular force line for F2 slightly shorter than F1 and F3. And uh, you know you don't necessarily have to do it that way. It's a kind of question of how much detail you remember as you are diagramming and thinking through the problem solving. Um, what I am remembering here is one of the first things you will see in chapter five, which is Coulomb's law, that the magnitude of electric force is a constant, Coulomb constant, times the product between the two charges divided by distance squared. That's the magnitude. And if you want to look at this as a vector quantity, as we will want to, you have to make sure that um, it's uh, along this uh, correct direction, R hat one two. Uh, one of the lecture videos cover, uh, and your textbook covers what that direction looks like. Well, you know, it looks like these directions that I have labeled. The magnitude of the force depends on distance. And I can see from the geometry here that this charge here is at a distance farther away than the other two charges. So that's why I drew this magnitude smaller. Now, you don't have to. At the stage of drawing free body diagram, it's kind of, it's a problem solving tool for you to think through the problem and, um, and whatever you remember, great, it will help you. And what you maybe didn't remember, there are opportunities for that to come up. So let me try to write down a, a net force equation here so that I can eventually work towards the magnitude of the net force. So net force as a vector quantity is equal to F1 as a vector plus F2 as a vector plus F3 as a vector. <laughs> um, it's uh, kind of deceptively simple. Let me take a route that uh, maybe qu not quite as uh, accessible um, 
accessible in terms of um, it, it's not the exact same approach we would have used in physics 4a where um, we sacrifice some of the general applicability of expressions um, so that as we are writing it down, it's more intuitive. It's a less formal and it's, a, um, it's less abstract. <laughs> so kind of the theme of this class, Physics 4B, is that we do get into more abstract portions of physics problem solving. So let me start doing that in this question. And let me start writing down the expressions that are more abstract. So I'm going to write these three vectors first in the kind of schematic setup that's easy to write down. And then I'm going to add in the kind of, add in the other pieces, add in the vector um, calculation pieces in a bit. So let me write down the easy part first. I can write each of these vectors as the magnitude times the unit vector. So F1, the magnitude, and as I'm writing down the magnitude, let me substitute in the correct values for these variables. So um, F1 is gonna be Coulomb constant times product to the charges. That's just gonna be Q squared divided by the distance squared. Here, I can see that the distance is A, so A squared. And let me leave off the unit vector as simply um, R1 hat. And I'm going to remember that this is the direction for R1 hat. Okay, let me do the same thing for F2 and F3. So for F2, uh, it actually becomes more or less the, oh wait, wait, sorry, F2 <laughs> is that one. Um, so I have to be careful to use this distance here that, you know, I use Pythagorean theorem. So, you know, it's a right triangle with uh, two legs of A. So the length here should be square root of A squared plus A squared. And you work that out, it turns out to be square root of two times A. You know, 45, 45, 90 degree angle, triangle. So let me remember to use that. So it's gonna be K times product of charges divided by, well, square root of two squared, so two times a squared. And let me label this r2 hat plus for f3. The magnitude will be same as before with the f1, k times q squared over a squared times r. Now, what's different is the unit vector. And you can see that here with a free body diagram that's kind of the reason I drew it, um, R3 hat. So now as you look at these uh, expressions, I hope you recognize that you can't quite simply add them yet because these three vectors are different. You can't just add the coefficients together when these vectors are different. So, um, so what we did in physics 4A was we did kind of from the start, we broke down vectors into components. You know, so this is along the X direction, this is along the Y direction. Uh, the F2 has components along the X and Y direction. We broke them down so that um, we can always have X hat or Y hat for these terms. Now, in a more general sense, we are not doing that. But in this particular case, it will be useful to um, express each of these unit vectors in terms of, um, in their decomposed form, in terms of X hat and Y hat. And I think in this setup, it's simple enough, you can kind of take a guess. Um, with the R1 hat, I can guess that that's X hat, because that's what that looks like. So I'm gonna just replace R1 hat with X hat. With R3 hat, it's also relatively simple. It, uh, it looks like it's going in the negative Y direction and it's the way I drew my axis. So it's gonna be minus Y hat. That's my guess. And I think that looks about right. So I'm gonna use that for R3 hat there. R2 hat is the one that um, takes the most of your effort. Um, there's actually a kind of a general formula for unit vector. 
in two dimensional plane, which I think is going to come up at some point. So let me just write it down anyway. The unit vector in two dimensional plane, it kind of looks like cosine theta times x hat plus um, sine theta times y hat, where theta is defined as the angle from the positive axis, x axis to the, the unit vector r hat. So there's that general formula, and I can definitely use that here to get um, r2 hat. But I'm actually just going to take a guess. Um, so from how this uh, vector appears, I can guess that x and y components have the same value. And what has to be enforced for unit vector is that when you take its dot product with itself, it's one, that it has unit length. So for R2 hat, um, the coefficients that satisfy that will be one over root two times X hat minus one over root two times Y hat. Um, you can verify for yourself that if you take this dot product of R2 with itself, you get one as you are hoping. The magnitudes of these two components are the same. And you know, one over root two x hat, it kind of goes in the right direction as far as the x component goes. And this also goes in the correct direction as far as the y component goes. So that's my guess. <laughs> I'm gonna use it. And you can, you know, you can verify that with this general formula too. Let me plug in those unit vector expressions and um, and get to something that I can algebraically simplify and get to the answer that they are asking for. And by the way, I do hope uh, uh, people understand that the path I'm taking is the long path, long route. Uh, this question, you know, it can be done. So I think I'm taking like 15, 20 minutes to do it. Can be done in five minutes. <laughs> I'm doing it this long way because I'm using this um, question as an excuse to talk about more abstract things that um, that will be important to understand both in this semester and as you really continue in your STEM education because some of the more sophisticated problem solving tools you use, the kind of common thing they have is their abstract. So let me write this down. K times Q squared over A squared, then R1 hat, I figured out that's X hat, plus K Q squared over 2A squared times R2 hat. Okay, that's this whole expression. So let me write it down. One over root two X hat minus one over root two Y hat, plus um, K Q squared over A squared are three, um, so uh, R3 hat was this minus Y hat. So uh, K Q squared over A squared times minus Y hat. And um, I hope as you write this down, or as I write this down, you notice that this minus sign matters because of this minus sign. It's a matter of do these two magnitudes add together or they subtract. So, okay, so I have that. And uh, now I'm able to simplify this by collecting like terms, by which I mean I collect the terms with the X hat and I collect the terms with the Y hat. Those are the like terms. And, and I, I like using those uh, phrases because I think uh, uh, um, the wording, like uh, collecting like terms, that's something I hope you remember from your high school algebra class. And the thing that I think is good to realize early on is how much of the procedures we use even in more advanced classes are really the same procedures that you learned in the supposedly lower level classes. Because the kind of the underlying logic justification, they are the same. So, um, so you know, just because we get more sophisticated doesn't mean we are not um, using the same tools that you learned since earlier in middle school and high school. So, so we are going to be collecting the like terms. Uh, let me just move this up so that I do have room to collect the like terms. All right. Okay, I think I just need just one more line to finish collecting like terms. Okay, let me write that here. This whole thing equals, let me collect all the terms with the X hat 
it's going to be this term here, kq squared over a squared. And then it's going to be this whole term. Uh, I'm going to do this product in my head. So it's going to be kq squared over root 2 times 2 a squared. Um, okay, that's all the terms with x hat. Let me do plus y hat times. Oh, all these are going to have minus sign in it. That's fine. Um, yeah, minus. Um, let me write down this term first. kq squared over a squared and then minus uh, one half, one over root two times that. So kq squared over root two times two times a squared. Okay, so this is my x component and this is my y component. It's just written in a way uh, that, so that this whole thing is a single vector equation. Um, but once you recognize those as components, then you know what to do, get the magnitude. To get the magnitude, all you have to do is take the square root of the sum of component squared. That's the Pythagorean theorem. So that's the calculation I'm going to do to get the component. But let me uh, simplify this a little bit. For, I think each of these, I can factor out um, kq squared over a squared. Those factors seem to appear in basically every term. So I guess what I'm going to do is I'm just going to work out the numerical coefficients in front of these and just to the final result multiply kq squared over a squared. That's almost like the unit that we are using. So this is basically minus one. This is minus uh, one over root two over two. This is a whole sum of component squared. Oh, I think I can do this in my calculator. So, so for the x component, the coefficient uh, in front of x component is one plus one divided by uh, parenthesis two times um, square root of two. I think that's, yeah, square root of two. Okay, that's the coefficient. Let me put equal sign. So yeah, 1.35, whatever. Um, so that's the coefficient for the x component. And when you see it here, you will see that, uh, oh, that is the same coefficient for the y component, just with the minus sign. And since you are squaring the component, the sign doesn't matter. So the, this quantity here, sum of components squared, what that is going to be is this quantity. Let me square it um, times two because there's two of them, x component and y component. So times two equals that. And I take the square root of that and that should be the coefficient. So 1.914 and that's kind of in units of kq squared over a squared. So let me put that in. Uh, 1.914 times k. Oh, uh, let me put in one more significant figure just in case. I think with this particular question type, the tolerance is a little bit lower. K times Q squared over, oops. I press the right arrow to get out of that exponent. Divide by, um, divide by A squared. Okay. Why does it say syntax error? Oh, oh I think, uh, yeah, K sub E. <laughs> K sub E. Okay. Um, so let me put that in as the answer and see what it says. Yeah, it says it's correct. Um, and by the way, just so that you can see, um, in this class, I will try to accept both uh, Coulomb constant for this and uh, what's called the permittivity of free space. So this Coulomb constant, it has a, a, a way in which it can be expressed in the SI unit, which is, let me do that here, parenthesis, one over four pi uh, times epsilon naught. Epsilon, so submit, and yeah, the, um, I kind of coded the two different answers so the system will understand both. Um, so yeah, that's a, again, long way to do a, what is a simple question and you can do it simply.
The direction, once you have this, um, um, once you have this vector expression, then direction actually has a kind of a relatively simple formula. The formula, and the way I like to state the formula is this. The way I like to state the formula is in terms of tangent of the angle. So the formula is tangent of theta is equal to the, um, the y component of the vector divided by the x component of the vector. And I want to highlight how this is not the exactly same thing as saying that theta is the arc tangent of fy over fx. And um, that's because the you know, arc tangent is only defined from negative, uh, negative 90 degrees to positive 90 degrees. So somehow if the, in the question you're dealing with the theta falls at, I don't know, 145 degrees, then, um, then you won't get the correct answer through this. The, this uh, form of expression kind of reminds you that uh, you have to check which quadrant the theta is in. So I like to use that. So the ratio of Fy over Fx, oh, that's gonna be minus one because all, everything is same except for the sign. So tangent of theta is minus one. Now, so you think through, okay, what values of theta can satisfy that? Uh, negative 45 degree does. Um, so, and it, in fact, that is what it looks like. This looks like minus 45 degrees. So, all right, so I'll just put in, aha, uh -huh. okay, I was going to say put in minus 45 degrees, but I read the question carefully and it says below the horizontal. And I know that I dislike <laughs> double negatives <laughs> and I probably didn't want to say some negative angle below the horizontal because then it becomes ambiguous. Do I mean plus 45 degree above horizontal or am I saying negative and below twice for emphasis? Uh, normally I don't, so I'm gonna get rid of that minus sign because the below the horizontal in the text already gives you the uh, direction of the angle, so. Now, you know, sign error is one of the most uh, common errors somehow. So somehow if you did it, uh, did it this way and the question told you, oh, you, that's wrong. Then what I would say you should try is, okay, see if your sign was wrong. <laughs> that's like the first thing you should uh, take a look at before you do any other thing to try to fix uh, whatever it was wrong. So, okay, so that's uh, kind of the, that's the end of this question. Um, Again, this is taking a lot longer than it needs to <laughs> do it uh, for the sake of um, highlighting an approach that we've been avoiding so far, which is a kind of formal, um, formalistic approach. And um, with the physics 4A, that you know, formalistic approach probably would have worked terribly with the most people. And even in physics 4B, it might still work terribly. But um, I think you've seen the, the less formal, kind of the question specific approach um, enough times now that um, what you, I think what, I, what you would gain more is from the approach like this, where I'm basically trying to write down expressions that will always hold. Um, and one of the things you see me not do when I'm using this formal approach is uh, in physics 4A, I prefer to write my equations so that these variables are all positive. You see me no longer doing that. I'm simply saying, well, I'm dealing with the sum of vectors. So I'm just gonna add up all the vectors, even though for some of them, they do go in the negative direction according to how we define direction. But when you use the formal approach, you don't make those individual adjustments, kind of trusting that the formal mechanics will handle all those issues.